So I'd ask you to stand. We'll go to his word. We'll ask God to speak to us this morning. Father God, I thank you for each person here uh, that you know by name and uh, that you want to uh, minister to. And uh, I just pray that you would have your way in this place, that our hearts would be open to what you want to say and what you want to sow. We know that uh, you are here with a desire to make us grow. So we say yes to your word. We thank you that your word doesn't return void. Your word is there to build us up, and we say yes to what you want to do this morning. So we choose to open up. We choose to say yes to what you want to say, and help me to communicate what you've placed on my heart, and Father, go beyond what I have to say by Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we are in this topic of revival and prayer. Well, we focused on prayer in the last few weeks, and... Um, I'd like to talk about intercession this morning. I'd like to unpack this word that you might be familiar with or you might not be familiar with, intercession. And uh, when it comes to spending time with God, one of the things that you know and that we try to share on a regular basis is that we're called to have a life of devotion, right? And a life of devotion is where you take time with the Lord, where God fuels you, where you connect with God, where you get refreshed by Him, a time when you open the word and you let God speak to you, where you approach God beyond just the intellectual level, is where you have interaction with God when you read his word, right? God wants to have interaction with us, right? So God wants us not to do life on empty. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, 18, do not get drunk with wine which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're not filled with the Holy Spirit if we don't have this connection with God. There's a good chance we'll walk in the flesh. Do you, you believe that it's possible to be a Christian living in the flesh? I think so, right? So what needs to happen is that you need to be renewed by God, right? You need God's visitation. You need to have an encounter with God. And you, you want to come and drink and you want to uh, feed. And for those that are fasting, you know what I mean when it comes to have a lack of food, right? You go a few days on water and your body tells you, are you crazy? Uh, so it's the same thing when it comes to my spirit. My inner man needs to be fueled. So we want to have devotion. We, have, we want to have a time with God. We want to have this interaction with God. So this is huge when it comes to living a life that honors him. At the same time, parallel to this, what we want to see in our lives is that we want to grow in intercession. We want to grow in that ministry that we're all called to do is to intercede. Can you tell your neighbor that you have this calling to intercede? Intercede. What does intercession mean? What does it mean? It means to stand in the gap. It means to re represent someone else when it comes to prayer. When you have your devotion, the focus of your devotion, most of the case, is you and God and you're fueled by God. And it's awesome to have this connection with God. But when it comes to intercession, is that you're kind of putting yourself on the side. On the, you put, you're putting yourself on the back burner instead of, instead of being in the front burner. And you start to pray for God to intervene in someone else's life or in a situation where you pray for breakthrough. How many of you, you would agree with me that we are in need of breakthroughs? Ah, when it comes to our land, we need breakthroughs, right? And so how will the breakthroughs come and how can we see breakthroughs? And I, I really believe it is birth through intercession. So we're going to talk about, try to unpack what, it, what does it mean to stand in the gap. Tell your neighbor your call to stand in the gap. Stand in the gap and intercede. So we want to have this love for God and devotion, but we also want to have a love for others in intercession. We want to have a burden, a godly burden that we carry for others. So if, if you have your Bible, take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, as I lay the foundation for this message. I think it's important to find what God's intention was for us when it comes to um, life as he placed us on planet earth. And it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So what it says here is that God placed us 
to rule. Can you tell your neighbor, I'm here to rule? Ha! <laughs> yeah, right? You've got to be careful when it comes to your wife. I'm here to rule. That's, whoa. Can be dangerous, right? What, was, what, what God is saying here is that we're called to, we were called to manage. God has given us this authority to manage, called us to manage. And you find also in Genesis 2, verse 15, this, this, this also this thought. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. To do what? To work it and take care of it. So God did not do it for Adam and Eve. It's not like they, they uh, got their lawn chair on the, on the, the beach of uh, Eden <laughs> and then soak there and let God do everything. As much as they enjoyed this, this garden and the blessings of God, they had a calling and they had responsibilities. It's the same thing when it comes to us. We have calling, we have a calling, and we have responsibilities. But God has given us this authority, and God has given us this mandate to, to, to be his ambassadors for him. We'll talk about that in a moment. In Psalm 115, verse 16 says, The highest heaven belongs to the Lord, but the earth he has given or assigned to man. So God is expecting us to be functional, all right? God is expecting us to be fruitful. And you see that in the gospel where Jesus is talking about the trees that are called to be fruitful, the fig tree that's called to be fruitful. So one of the things I need to realize this morning is that I have delegated authority. God has delegated his authority to me as I walk on this earth and as I'm a child of God and as I, I do ministry. It says in Matthew 18, 18, I tell you the truth, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Meaning that God will honor what we do. But at the same time, you've got to uh, understand that we are ambassadors according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That we are ambassadors of king and country. And that is Christ the king. And heaven is our country. Right? So uh, an ambassador doesn't call the shots. Right? An ambassador doesn't come, go into a new country and do what he desires. He represents his country. So what he needs to know is what is his king asking, right? How does heaven function? So the role of the ambassador is to represent his country into a strange land. But he doesn't do that on his own, right? So we're not called to be lone rangers or to be lone wolves. We're called, to be, uh, we're called to be ambassadors uh, representing the nation that uh, we were sent by, and that's heaven, and Jesus is our king, right? But that means at the same time that we have authority. It's like a police officer. When you get pulled over, uh, if you see a, a cop coming to your car, you don't look in your mirror and say, oh, well, he's just, he's just five, uh, I don't know, five nine and he's weighing only 160 pounds and because of how big he is you just take off because he's not big you don't care right like just a small cop who cares i just can't go but then you see this huge cop like a, a freezer come out that comes out of the car right and then you go yeah I'm like, yes sir yes sir you'll obey to what he has to say you know that it has nothing to do with his size it has to do uh, based on what he represents, right? He comes in the name of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of, of the law, so you respect him. It's the same thing when it comes to us. We, we have to realize that God has placed us with a calling and, and that we have an authority and that we're called to stand in that authority, that we're called to, to do the work of the, the, the ministry based on the lordship of Christ in our lives. And it's not to do things on our own, but to realize that we are ambassadors in his name. It's the same thing when it comes to prayer. Like Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, to, to approach God as a father and to see his kingdom come and his will be done through prayer, right? That's what he says. Pray that uh, his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, so what does that mean? Is that we're called to facilitate God's will on earth. It's like what it says to pray for the harvest master in Matthew chapter 9 to send workers, workers into the field. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, pray for the harvest master to, pray for, uh, for, to see workers into the field. So what if we don't pray the harvest master to send workers into the field? What if 
We don't pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. What if we don't pray for his kingdom to come? Wow, that's a good thought, right? That's food for thought, right, when you think about it. And I, I, I want you to see that when it comes to the will that God has and the plan that God has, God's going to fulfill it with our partnership. That God wants to come in and God wants to work and God wants to reveal himself, but it's going to be revealed. It will, give, it will be brought to pass by our prayer, by our intercession when we stand into the gap when it comes to whatever we face, whatever is before us, when it comes to pray for nation, pray for our neighborhood, pray for our family, pray for our kids, we stand in the gap. And God wants us to stand in the gap because this is how he reveals his will. This is how his will comes to pass when we pray for his will. It's like facilitating his will. So we want to see that in our lives. So we're a part of seeing the will of God come. We're part of seeing uh, people sent by the, by the Lord into the field. It's like we pray for the Lord to send workers into the field. God touches the hearts. God reveals himself in, in the heart of the people. But we're part of that. You see? And sometimes how we see prayer is we only see prayer as devotion. And it's true. But prayer is also st- Uh, standing in the gap in the name of and praying for a breakthrough. And God responds to that, always has and always will. So that puts responsibility on us, right? It, It talks about a calling. It talks about a need that God is looking for us to respond to that invitation of praying through. And this is when it comes to intercession. When it comes to devotion, you have this communion with God. When it comes to intercession, it's to pray through things. You pray it through. It's more than one, just one shot. It's more than just having a, a little prayer before you go to bed. Is you pray it through. And to pray it through, we'll talk about that in a moment. Sometimes it's hard work. Where you persevere, where you don't quit, where you just go and you just, you're waiting for God to do a breakthrough, but you realize that God's going to bring this breakthrough as you persevere in prayer. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, for example, It talks about that we are at war and there's a battle going on. We got to be conscious of this, people. Life is way more than just what we see. There's this physical world and there's a spiritual realm. And as we pray, we're tapping in the spiritual realm. We're talking, we're connecting with God, but we're also influencing the spiritual realm. And that's what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, finally be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood. Can you tell your neighbor that we don't fight against flesh flesh and blood? People are not our enemy. Maybe you think your boss is your enemy. Maybe you think your wife is your enemy. Hopefully that's not the case. We don't fight against flesh and blood. Okay? Got to realize that. When, When we do life and we feel, and we see a position, it's higher It's spiritually that's happening. So we got to remove the faces and remove the names and realize that there's a higher power, there's a battle going on. you got struggles in relationship. Instead of building bitterness and, and hatred and vengeance towards the person, realize that there's a battle going on. It's spiritually. We don't fight against flesh and blood. That's what it says right after. It says, but against rulers. When it talks about rulers, it talks about principalities. It talks about demons. So we're not, we're, uh, um, it says here, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavy places. So what happens is, is that we are in this battle, like it or not, it's happening. So I want to be conscious of it. So what I want to do, according to this text, I want to put on God's armor. That means that I want to walk in righteousness. I want to walk in godliness. I want to walk according to his ways. And when I do, I don't give access to the enemy. But also what I'm called to do, according to verse 18, I'm called to pray. Look what it says. And pray in the spirit on all occasions for all kinds, uh, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Why? Why do this? Because when you pray, you prepare the way for God to come and move. It's like a bit like John the Baptist that was uh, the forerunner. He prepared the way of the Lord. So when you stand in the gap, 
when you intercede, when you pray for, you're preparing and making a way for God to intervene and making a way for God to step in. So there's this partnership that we have with God. Instead of reacting in the flesh, instead of being uh, taken by fear, anxiety, and discouragement, realize that you can make a difference. Realize that as you stand in the gap, as you pray, as you intercede, as you say, God, in your name, come and move, God releases his will, unrolls his plan, fulfill what he wants to fulfill through us. Amazing, right? Through us. So this is why intercession is huge. My second point here is my prayer matters. What I pray matters. Uh, I, was, I was saying last week that uh, waiting upon the Lord, it's not wasted time. Well, praying is not wasted words. When you pray, it's not like when you see in TVs where you look at programs and it's, there's such a mockery on prayer that people pray just because it's the thing to do, but it doesn't work. But prayer stirs up the heavens. Prayer moves God. Not that it controls God. Not that it forces God, because God is sovereign. He does what he wants. But God responds to the heart that cries to him, that calls upon him. One example that you find in the Bible is the story of Elijah. And James gives us a a snapshot of the life of Elijah that was a tremendous prophet. And we see his life, well, you you can see in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, a snapshot of the life of of, uh, Elijah, and James resumes it in verse 5, verse verse 16. He says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Wow. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. It's, here it says that Elijah was a man like us. Like he wasn't 10 feet tall, by the way. Okay? He was a man just like us. And James specified this because he wants us to get it. He wants us to get it. Elijah was like us. He had struggles in his life. Actually, when you read his, his life, when you study his life, he dealt with depression. It was hard. He had highs and lows. And sometimes he wanted to quit. He wanted to throw the towel. He just wanted to run away. And not just he wanted to run away, he ran away. And he was like us. He had holes in his life like we do. He had struggles in his life like we do. But one of the things that he did, he prayed earnestly. He was a fervent prayer warrior. And God responded to that. Listen, God does not respond to who I am like when it comes to my weaknesses and all that, because God knows how I am. God is not waiting for me to be at a certain level before he answers my prayer. Listen to this, this is huge. But when you step in the gap, earnestly, fervently seek his face, God will reveal himself to you. And that's what James was saying. Is James was saying that Elijah is like us. When I think about Elijah and I look at his signs and wonders and I look at this man, he's off the chart. Who am I to compare myself with them? But James is saying, you have the same nature as him. You know? So what I need to take a hold of is how, how did he function? Earnestly, he prayed. Earnestly, he prayed. And you look at 1 Kings 18, verse 1. It says, after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and, and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. It was God's idea to send rain on the land, right? It was not Elijah doing his own thing, right? Remember, I'm an ambassador. I'm not the king. He's the king. I obey him. I respond to him. I'm submitted to him. I go according what he tells me. So God said to Elijah, I'm sending rain, but I'm going to do it through you. I'm going to do it through you. So the story goes Elijah prays, prays the first time earnestly, fervently, prays for rain to come. And then he sends his servant to see if there's clouds. His servant goes, and there's no cloud. Come on, God. Get with it, right? So prays, he goes and he prays again earnestly, fervently for rain. Still no clouds. Third time, still no clouds. Fourth time, no clouds. 
fifth, sixth, seventh time he prays, and the servant comes back, running, he comes running back. I see this little white poofy cloud the size of a fist. <laughs> and Elijah is all excited. This is going to rain. Rain is on the way. Woo-hoo. Pour the on. It's going to rain. He saw a cloud big as a fist. Who brought the rain? God did. Through who? Elijah. You see? God had a will. God had a plan. God had rain to bring. But as Elijah persevered earnestly, did not stop at the one, he probably would have went to 20. Right? He didn't stop. And that's what James is saying to us when it comes to prayer. That when we, are into, when we put ourselves in the gap and we want to see God move, we, got, well, we want to see God show up earnestly. We seek after that. We are desperate to see God move. And we say, God, come and move upon our land. Come and move in my marriage, God. Come and move in my kids. You got your kids that are drifting away, and you start to pray, God, move in my kids. Move in my kids. And you don't give up. And you stand in the gap, and you fervently, you pray, you pray, you pray. You know what you're doing? You're making a way for God to intervene. Wow. You're giving birth to the, to the will of God, to the heart of God for that situation. I think that's fantastic. And sometimes we see prayer as just, like I said, just a, a quick devotion just to make our life safe. And yes, it is, can make our life safe, safe. But there's a different level where you become a prayer warrior, where God works through you and is established, and he establishes his will and his kingdom through you and me. Every revival, yay, every revival was birth in prayer because it prepared the way for God to come in, prepared our hearts because when you pray, it molds you in the inside, it breaks you in the inside, but also what it does, it makes a way for God to come. It opened the, it opened the doors and opens the gates for God to come in. That's what prayer does. So when you look at your role as a prayer warrior, as an intercessor, it's huge. Because we can change, we can see God change the landscape of our nation, of our community, of our homes, as we let as we get closer to him in prayer, as we stand in the gap in his name. Awesome. I look at Abraham. He stood before Sodom and Gomorrah in the sake, for the sake of Lot, his nephew, interceded. And God granted him mercy and Lot was saved. I look at Moses when he saw the people um, build this golden calf as he came down of the mountain, and God was just broken to see them loving an idol after he saved them. And Moses is there interceding, God, have mercy over your people. God responded to that. I, I look at Daniel when he said, forgive my sin, forgive our sins, Lord, when he was a captive in Babylon, and it was not his fault, he was a righteous man. But he stands before God and he says, forgive our sins, we've walked against you. God, restore us, restore Israel. Let, let us go back to the promised land. And God work through that. You see, there's this partnership that we have with God. God is sovereign. He can do what he wants. He's the master of everything. We can't tell what God to do. He does as he pleases. But he has ch- cho- cho- chosen to flow through me and you as we pray. So my role and your role is huge when it comes to prayer. So intercession is way more than just one prayer. It's, it's something that we pray through. I, I like what it says in Isaiah 59 as an eye opener. Isaiah 59 verse 15, it says, The Lord saw it, and it, deple- it, de- and it de- displeased him that there was no justice among the Israelites. It was broken to see the injustice in Israel. And he saw there was no man, and he wondered that there was no, no one to intercede. So, God wants to move. God is seeing the brokenness in Israel. And he's in shock that there's no one standing in the gap. That's what it means. He's looking around and there's no one standing in the gap. There's no one that will will pray that's praying for a breakthrough. Because this is how God works. There's no one that was there to pray. And it's the same thing today. You know, God has given me a job. And has placed a calling in my life to be a watchman of prayer. Can you tell your neighbor that you're called to be a watchman? A watchman. Look at Paul. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2. He's totally aware of that. 
And he says, devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. That's pretty strong. Being watchful, you're a watcher, you're watching. You want to see, uh, you want to see God come, you want to see the enemy be kept at, at bay. So being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open the door for our message so that we may proclaim the mysteries of Christ for which I'm in chains. So he's asking them to pray for God to open doors. What if they don't pray? What if they don't respond, right? You see that partnership? He's saying, pray for God to open doors. I need your prayers. I need you to intercede. I need you to stand in the gap because this is how God will have his way. This is how God will come through. And and so so we want to respond to God in this way. We want to carry his will and his heart, and that's going to be through prayer. Isaiah 62 verse 6 says, I have posted watchmen on the wall, O Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord for those that intercede, Give yourself no rest. Give yourself no rest. Don't stop praying. Don't stop standing in the gap. Don't stop interceding. That's what he's saying. Don't give yourself no rest. That's our calling to stand in the gap and to to ask God to move. So like I said, prayer prepares the way of the Lord. It, it, It sets the table up for God. Ezekiel 22 verse 30 says, I've looked for a man among them who would build up a wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. And he looked among the prince, no one. He looked among, among the priests, there was no one. Officials, no one. Prophets, no one. And there was no one among the people. There's no one that was responding. And he's, God is searching on the earth for someone to stand in the gap. And it's the same thing today. God is looking for people that will stand in the gap to see his will be done and to see a breakthrough upon our land and upon, upon our world, upon my world, upon your world. I, I look at Paul, what he writes in Galatians chapter 4, verse, 12, verse 19. Look, look how intense it is. He says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. He wants to see Christ be formed in the Galatians, but he says, I'm called to, tra- to, to go through the giving birth process again. I don't know what travailing is, but I saw my wife travail, and I thank God that I'm a man after I saw her travail. Praise God that I'm, I'm, I'm a man. I think if us men, we would be um, travailing, I think our family would stop at one, right? After the first one, we're done. No more pain, not like that, not anymore, and that's enough, right? Wait, what Paul, and you look at this story, Paul talks about travailing. I'm travailing for you. I'm, I'm, it's heavy. I'm praying for you. I'm working for you. And because of the travailing, you see people be rooted with God or being rooted in God and to see people grow. You, you see the travailing needed. You see the partnership with God. If God could do it on his own, what's the point of travailing? What, what's travailing for? Why travail? Because God is working with us. He puts things into our heart and we carry it through. He deposits things into our heart, care, and we pray. And we're broken, we pray. It, involves, it also involves our emotions and all that. And we pray and God fulfills his ways through it. When I look at the result, the result is in God's hand. I'm not saying that because you travail and because you intercede, you will see everything that you want being fulfilled. But what you will see, though, it's the will of God and the plan that he has in store come to pass. And really, that's what really matters, right? Still with me? Hope that you are. You look at this Great example of a godly man in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. So the end result is fully assured, mature, firm in God's will. But there's a man that wrestled. Wrestled in prayer. Wrestled in prayer for the Colossians. Wrestled in prayer. Um, 
our team sport when I was in high school was wrestling. And uh, sometime it was not too fun to go to, the, to, to go to the gym because we had to wrestle and that means that you're on top of guys and, and there's some guys that uh, never washed their clothes and their t-shirt was like almost standing on, on the, by themselves, right? And they had some yellow patches under their armpit and then they rubbed that armpit in your face. You had kind of a supernatural strength just to come out of that, just to be free, right? And one of the conversations we had is go, bring your clothes home, bud. Bring your clothes home. It's nothing like being under some guy that hasn't washed his t-shirt for the whole year, right? But as for you fathers, when you wrestle with your kids, it's tiring. <laughs> you can you horse around, you play with your kids, and poof, huffing and puffing is very hard, right? It's taxing. It's taxing when you wrestle. And uh, here you see this man is wrestling for the church. Wrestling. It's intercession. He's wrestling. He's putting himself in the gap between God and, 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 and the people. And he's praying, praying God's will to be fulfilled, giving birth to God's will. But it, it needs, needs commitment. It needs sacrifice. There's, there's a wrestling that, that happens. But the thing is, when you wrestle, when you stand in the gap, this is where God makes his way. This is where God fulfills his plans. I've got to tell you that whatever work of God that we see, whatever breakthrough that we will see, there's some people behind the scene that have wrestled, interceded, sacrificed, prayed to see a breakthrough. And I believe that as we're going forward, as we want to see revival and breakthroughs, and we want to see the church grow, and we want to send people, and we want to multiply and so on, it's only going to happen as we wrestle in prayer, as we seek his face, as we turn to him. So there's things, my third point here, there's things that we can't change but through prayer. Have you ever been in a situation that you know whatever you say, it's not going to fix anything? Look at a situation you don't know how to fix, and... What you can do, though, it's to pray. What you can do, it's to pray God's will into being. You can pray God's will to come to pass. You can, you can open the door for God to make a way through prayer. And that's what Habakkuk says in chapter 3, verse 2, when he prays for a revival for his nation. He says, I have heard about you, O Lord. I'm filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in the years gone by. In your anger, remember your mercy. He, he, he remembers what the Lord has done, and he's excited for that. God, you're amazing, but you need to do it now. We need it now. It's like we hear stories of South Korea, of churches that are growing, and churches that are praying, and they're sending people all over the world. It's so amazing to see. But do, don't you have sometimes the desire to see God do that here? You hear stories of Afri in Africa or India or of signs and wonders and God showing up in South Africa and so on where, where even the dead are being raised and, and all of that. And you say, wow, it's so amazing. Then we come back to, to the Western world and nothing is happening. And we say, God, you know, we, I think we got to have the spirit of, of Habakkuk where he says, God, move like you move over there. Move as, as you've done in the past. This is where the intercession comes, where we seek for a breakthrough, where we seek God to come in. And as we do this, as we wrestle, as we give birth, like Paul was talking about, and we pray for God to move, God will respond to our prayers because that's what God does. He says that's what he told us to do. Pray for the will of the Father to be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, that's, that's the calling that we have. And my prayer of all, from all my heart is that you would see this this morning and you would, you would realize how, how you can change your world, how, how you have this authority to make a difference. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager or you, you are a, you're homebound. God wants to use you so that you can make a way for what God has in store. I like what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. It says, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. Have you ever been in a place where there's no words coming out of your mouth? You're just, ugh. You're broken inside and, and your face is red because tears are just flowing. And the, 
Kleenex don't come fast enough, right? You're just broken, and, and you're just pouring your heart, and like words cannot describe, because there's a burden in your heart. It's heavy upon your heart, and you're just before God. See, that's what it talks about. The Spirit also intercedes for us to make a way to the will of the Father. You see, when we come weak and we can't do it on our own, the Spirit comes in and through our groaning and our weeping and our brokenness, God makes a way. Even God sends the Spirit so that this may happen so his will can come to pass. Powerful, eh? I think it's Wow, when I think about that. So I say, God, take a hold of my, my inner man. Give me your burden. Give me what you have at heart so that I can make a difference in my world, in my environment. And when I don't know how, I pray for the Holy Spirit to arise in me with groaning where I'm just broken before him. When I do this, I'm making a way for God to intervene. This is why prayer is huge. This is why prayer is huge. Whew. I want to read a text to you that was been on my heart in this time of fasting. It's been the uh, theme for my fast. I'm sharing, to, sharing it to you just as an example. It's Psalm 24, verse 7. As we enter the time of fasting and praying and I'm saying, God, what do you want to do? What is your plan for me? What do you want to do in my life? And this is where this verse, these verses came just... They hit me right in the bulls, bullseye in my heart. And it says, open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, let the king of glory enter. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven's army. He is the king of glory. And I have this, this illumination in my heart of the doors in my life that are preventing him to come in. The gates that are up. So I had to wait and take some time with the Lord and ask the Lord, God, where are the gates? Where are the, where are the walls in my life, the doors in my life that are shut, that are prevent, pre preventing you to come like a mighty warrior in me? Where are the, where are the gates? So then I had a time of, of, with the Lord, show me God. And God, my, my, my pen went. I said, There's some things to write to a point you say, God, okay, it's enough. <laughs> then you deal with that and then you experience confession and you come before him. Say, God, free me. I want to see these doors open up. And then it came to the church where you pray for the church for the gates to open up, for the doors to open up, Right? And, 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 and I, I believe that God wants to come, like Jesus wants to come like a mighty king. And he wants to establish. And he, it says here that he comes like a mighty warrior, invincible, invincible in battle. I want him to come in. I want him to come in. And where I am in my prayer right now, my prayers, it's still close. But my call is to bash these doors and say, gates, Open up. Doors, open up. Let the king of glory enter. Let the king of glory come in the church. Let the king of glory enter my life. I'm called to intercede that. Because I believe the king of glory wants to come in. I believe the king of glory wants to come in your life. I believe the king of glory wants to walk and flow in this church and flow in this community in this region. I believe that. What God is asking of me, it's to bash these doors and not to quit, to do like Elijah. God, come and move. God, come and move. Come and restore. God, to do like, um, uh, I forget his name here, Abacuc. God, come and move like you did in, in time of old. Come and intervene. So I'm in this journey right now and this week just to bash these doors and say, God, I need to see a breakthrough. Come and move. Come and move. And God responds to that. In that process, God changes me and breaks me. But also God moves and reveals himself and shows up. You see, we are at war like it or not. And you are a person of influence. And God wants to use you. God doesn't want you to quit. 
God doesn't want you to throw the towel. God doesn't want you to take the path of less resistance and just live your coast, coast through life, having your salvation in your back pocket, pocket and waiting for Jesus to come. God has called you to stand in the gap. And my prayer is that you would see this call and you would step out. I remember this song, I'm, I'm going over time here. The song that I listened, I probably shared that before when I was a teenager. It was uh, from Sweet Comfort Band. It was called, Where Are the Heroes Now? Who will step out of the crowd and be strong enough to lead? Where are the, where are the Moses now? Where are the Elijahs now? Where are these men and ladies that will come out from the crowd and be strong enough to lead? Who will come and go on the walls of Jerusalem and intercede? Who will put, go in, the, in, in, in between this community and God? Who will stand and do spiritual warfare to see a breakthrough? May we respond like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. Or here I am, Lord, use me. God has great things in store. He wants to partner with us. Amen? I would ask you to stand. It's Father. You're so amazing. You're so good, Father. You're a good, good Father. Where would we be without you? Father, it's so amazing to be able to meet with you on a daily basis. We thank you that the veil is thorn, torn and we can approach you with freedom. We thank you for that we can approach you with assurance and in boldness and to be loved by you and, and to know you personally. At the same time, Father, I want to wrestle. At the same time, I, I want to give birth to your will. I want to wrestle for your will to come. Father, I pray that my heart would stir, be stirred up this morning, that I, I would place myself available for you, that I would seek and long for a breakthrough, that I would have the spirit of Elijah that doesn't quit, earnestly, fervently sought you. Father, you want to raise a people that, would, that will fervently, earnestly seek you, desire you for this land. Father, I pray that our desire is to, to see your kingdom come on earth. To see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we pray for you to send workers into the field. Like it says in Matthew 9, where you invite us to pray for the harvest master to send workers into the field. Father, I pray for this burden to pray for workers. Father, stir my heart with the things that are in yours. Father, may we be vessels that you flow through. May we be like John the Baptist, forerunners preparing the way of the Lord through prayer, intercession, and devotion. So we offer our lives to you, Father, and we pray that you would bring us deeper as a church, as a soldier, as, as your son, Father, I pray that you would find me faithful that you would find me faithful to the call that you've placed on me, Father. That I would wrestle, that I would stand in the gap, that I would see that the clouds are coming, that you want to rain and you want to refresh this land. Help me, help us, Lord, to stand in the gap. In Jesus' name, amen.
closing my mic. Sorry, guys. Just to let you know that we have a prayer room in the back. We would like to pray for you. If you've uh, walked away from the faith or you're lukewarm, you know that you need blood transfusion. You need Jesus in your life. I invite you to go for prayer. If you're going through a hardship, whatever the situation, go for prayer. Be ministered to. If not, well, may the Lord bless you and may you have a great day. May you be filled with the Spirit. Thank you so much for coming.